Wow. <laughs> it is such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. And honey, wow. <laughs> Very moved. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. You know, I know that I'm not alone in this room and you being just a huge fan of Honey's admiring her professional work and just adoring her as a human being. So I want to thank her, I want to thank the Jewish Funders Network, Andres, and everyone who's been involved in hosting this event, where we can really talk about how to engage Jews with rich, meaningful content. And I really commend you all for taking this on. I don't think there is any more urgent or important issue for the Jewish people today. And I also think there is no more challenging issue. And you know, I say this not as a rabbi or a Jewish professional or a scholar. I am none of those things. I say this as a regular Jew who, whose own story I think really illustrates the challenges and the difficulties of getting engaged in Jews, getting Jews engaged with really meaningful Jewish content. So I think I have what's a pretty typical non-Orthodox American Jewish upbringing. I went to Hebrew school, where many very hardworking Jewish educators did their absolute best to make up for the fact that neither I nor any of my classmates had any kind of Jewish practice going on at home, and I didn't enjoy it. My family attended high holiday services at our local synagogue, and I have to be honest, I found it excruciating. Uh, plodding through those awkward, responsive readings, reciting our lines on cue in that kind of old-timey language, it sort of felt like we were all bit players in this really depressing historical reenactment, and it just kind of left me feeling like Judaism was something to be endured rather than enjoyed. And you know, once I had my bat mitzvah, beyond grudgingly attending an occasional high holiday service, I was pretty much out. And then, about four years ago, I broke up with this guy that I'd been dating, and I suddenly had all this time on my hands that I needed to fill, and I got an email from the DCJCC advertising an eight-week-long Intro Judaism course. And I signed up for this class, not so much to fulfill some deep existential longing, but honestly, just to fill Wednesday nights. And you know, there was nothing particularly special about the class itself, but I was absolutely blown away by the material we were studying. You know, the texts on Jewish ethics and values, they were articulating my ethics and values but in a way that was far deeper and more insightful than I ever could have done myself. You see, seen through adult eyes, practices like Shabbat struck me as utterly brilliant and profoundly countercultural in a way that we desperately need right now. I mean, in our consumer society that tells us that we can never have enough money or possessions or success and we should just keep working harder and spending more, to have a tradition that insists that for 25 hours each week, we say, no boss, not going to answer your emails, no Facebook, I'm not going to sit around liking things and being advertised to and feeling bad about my life. Instead, I'm actually going to spend some time with my loved ones and stop trying to bend the world to my, to my will and actually appreciate what I have. Yeah, that's extraordinary. This initial class led me to other classes and a lot of reading on my own and then to my first Jewish meditation retreat which was where I was first exposed to a kind of Jewish spirituality that I found to be incredibly powerful and unlike anything I'd ever experienced in a synagogue. This was not the boring Hebrew school or the dull services I'd grown up with. It wasn't stale or boring or offensive. It was moving and insightful and incredibly relevant to my life today. So I think my story perfectly illustrates a key problem here. The fact is that the only points of contact many Jews have with Judaism are with its least accessible and most off-putting parts. If all you see of Judaism is your media or Hebrew school and two high holy day services a year, and if you don't have the extensive learning necessary to really understand the depth and complexity and beauty of Jewish liturgy, then to you, these services basically seem to depict a god who is a king on a throne in the sky and rewards and punishes people according to their merit and is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good and just really enjoys our repetitive prayers to him. And honestly, few Jews today, probably including a rabbi, believe in this kind of god. But like, how would you, as an average Jew, know that? And why would you walk away from this experience each year thinking, you know, I really think 
that Judaism can help me explore my big questions about what it means to be a good person and do good in the world and lead a purposeful life. I really think this is something I want to teach my kids. And I have to tell you, I find this to be maddening. Because all of this is precisely what Judaism has to offer people, but they have no way of knowing it. It's like this epic communications problem where we never convey to the average Jew precisely the things about Judaism that they would find to be most meaningful and relevant to their lives. And as a result, many Jews know very little about Judaism, like shockingly little. It actually reminds me of those surveys where they ask Americans to name the three branches of government. And a surprising number of people cannot name a single branch. I think if you did a similar survey of the Jewish people, I bet you would find that while many Jews know that the Torah is the thing on the scrolls in that cabinet at the front of the synagogue, I don't think they know what it actually is. Same thing with the Talmud. If you ask them what Jewish values are, they'd probably say something like social justice which is nice and certainly true, but that also happens to be a Christian value and a Buddhist value and a Muslim value and a secular humanist value. Now, there is certainly a really unique Jewish understanding of and approach to social justice, something entirely unique to Judaism, but they don't know that. If you ask them what the Jewish conception of God is, they likely won't know that that's a trick question, that there is no one established definition or theology of God in Judaism. And if you ask them what Judaism says about what happens after you die, chances are they don't really know. And these are not nitpicky questions about obscure points in Jewish law. These are some of the most important questions that we grapple with as human beings. So this is the first problem. People know very little, bit, very little about Judaism, and it's pretty unlikely that we'll have any reason to remedy that lack of knowledge. But let's just say that, like me, they somehow get inspired. They decide that, actually, maybe Judaism does have something to teach them, and they really <laughs> want to learn it. Honestly, I wish them luck. You know, I have two degrees from Harvard. I've written speeches for the President and First Lady of the United States, and while I have many, many flaws and weaknesses, being stupid is generally not one of them. <laughs> but trying to learn about Judaism has been one of the hardest things I have ever done. It makes working in the White House seem very, very easy. And I'm not talking about becoming a renowned scholar. That was never my goal. I'm talking about just grasping the basics. I'm talking about knowing enough to even begin learning. You know, one of the biggest challenges about Judaism is that everything is hyperlinked to everything else. And if you don't have basic background and context, learning any one thing is very confusing. So let's say you're a Jew like me five years ago, and someone presents you with a text study. Okay, so for starters, sorry, who are these rabbis who seem to be arguing with each other in this really old school language? Oh, right, sorry, those are the scholars who had to reimagine Judaism 2,000 years ago when the temple was destroyed. Okay, sorry, the temple? Yeah, so Jews back in the day, we actually used to worship God by sacrificing animals at a temple in Jerusalem. Okay, um, but where, where does the text that these guys are arguing about, it's like something from Exodus, where does that come from? Oh, right, but that's from the Torah. So, just what exactly is the Torah? It's the thing on the scrolls, but like, what, what is it? And so on. Jewish holidays and life cycle rituals and ethics are linked to Talmud and Torah, which is linked to Jewish history. And you kind of need to know a little bit about all of it to really understand any of it. And it is not easy to get that knowledge by reading on your own. Something that's occurred to me is that unlike Christians, because we don't proselytize, we actually don't have a ton of experience explaining Judaism to folks who know very little about it. And a lot of the material out there about Judaism is not particularly accessible. And I'm not just talking about our ancient texts. I'm talking about modern secondary sources as well. You know, I found that many of the smartest, most interesting, inspiring books about Judaism generally require some basic background. And I, I really couldn't understand them until I'd done a considerable amount of time working my way through introductory classes and books. And just not everyone has that kind of time or motivation and those kinds of resources. And this is actually one of the reasons why I decided that I wanted to write the kind of book that I wish I had had four years ago when I was just starting out. 
know, I'm trying to kind of bridge that gap a little bit in a book that is personal, it's written in the eye of voice, but I'm trying to convey a lot of substance about Judaism, and I'm trying to do so in a way that's accessible to people with no knowledge, but that's also smart and persuasive. And you know, I want to share with people what's really been meaningful for me. I want to show them that Judaism absolutely has something to offer them as well, but they have to be willing to go study. They just they have to be willing to actually do some learning on their own. And that is the part of my book I am totally dreading, which is the final part where I say, OK, here are some resources for learning. You know, I can recommend some books, a couple podcasts, maybe a few websites. But I really wish that there was a lot more to offer people, particularly when it comes to classes and events. You know, the truth is that a lot of Jewish engagement opportunities, especially for young adults, are pretty thin on the content. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Soul Cycle. Um, it's this really amazing spin class. It's like this exercise by class with great music and super energetic instructors. They light candles. It's like a dance party. And people work very hard in these classes. They burn hundreds of calories. They get in really good shape. And I have to be honest, a lot of Jewish engagement activities are kind of like Soul Cycle, but without any peddling. You know, it's like, Let's get together and make fun flavors of challah for Shabbat. Or let's have a party for Rosh Hashanah and make apple and honey teas. But let's not discuss the incredibly profound spiritual, moral, and cultural lessons of these Jewish holidays and practices. You know, it's fun, it's engaging, but you don't necessarily walk away transformed. And I think that's too bad because I think, as I said, I actually don't think people are just looking for things that are fun and easy. I think they're looking for things that are meaningful, too. And I certainly do not have the solutions here. I'm hoping you guys are just going to figure this all out today. But there is an approach that I think is pretty effective and that I want to highlight. And it involves the work being done by a rabbi named Aaron Kotek in Washington, D.C. Aaron is a rabbi from an organization called Gather that focuses on engaging 20 and 30-something Jews in Jewish life. And he and I have worked together on a couple of projects that may offer some ideas for how people to how to connect Jews to Jewish content. First, the first one is that about twice a year, Aaron leads this weekend-long retreat for 25 DC area Jews called Beyond the Tent, where they explore what it means to be Jewish and what Judaism has to say about the big questions that they're asking about their lives. So I taught at the first one of the retreats he did. And it was like this 48-hour-long deep dive into Jewish texts on a whole range of topics, from ethics and wisdom, money and sex, culture, community, spirituality. And while there was a social part of it, it really went beyond the usual icebreakers. It was sort of getting people to connect around really substantive, big things, everything from their struggles with God to their longing for meaningful Jewish community. The second project I worked with Mon, you may have heard about, uh, we hosted an alternative video before experience in Beer Garden in Washington, D.C. last year. And contrary to the news articles about this event, we were actually not playing shirtless beer pong. It was 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning. The bar was closed. We were just using the space. And we had 130 people there, with 50 more on the wait list. These were young Jews who were planning to do nothing on Yom Kippur, but instead they decided to join us and instead of just making them recite prayers that they don't understand, we actually dove into the substance of those prayers and the point of the day. We discussed the inner time of prayer in detail. Like, what does this prayer mean? What is the journey this prayer is trying to get you to take? We taught them about tshuva and Jewish notions of sin. We had them do a text study on Jonah. So this was engaging with Jewish content in more of a spiritual setting. And I think this is what characterizes some of the best engagement with Jewish content. It happens in a variety of different contexts, not just a synagogue. It involves really great teachers. It leads to programming like Beyond the Tent and like our alternative Yom Kippur experience that can be replicated by other rabbis and Jewish leaders in their own communities. And most of all, it requires some unconventional thinking. You know, Aaron definitely got some pushback for that Yom Kippur bit. People would say things to him like, why do you need to do this beer garden thing? Why can't you just hold the learner's menu at shul? And while I appreciated the feedback, the kind of Jews we were trying to reach aren't going to a shul. 
In fact, they don't know what the word shul and minion mean. So this kind of thinking kind of loses people at low. But I think if you're willing to be innovative and take some risks here, I think you all can make a huge difference. And I don't use the word huge lightly. I would really urge you to think big here. I would, I would think birthright big. I mean, think of what could happen if we invested that kind of commitment and passion and energy and that level of resources into a kind of birthright experiences that really exposes people to powerful Jewish ideas and practices and shows them how the wisdom and worldview of Judaism can transform their lives. And you know, just for me personally, discovering rich Jewish content absolutely changed how I see the world, changed how I live my life, and it's led me to really want to inspire others to have the same kind of experience. And I think if you could all can find a way to reach more Jews like me, you can have a tremendous impact on our Jewish future. So thank you for taking this on, and I really look forward to seeing what you all come up with.